a lot of the Chinese people we spoke to before they came to England had a picture of this country being very similar to the Darling Buds of May and then they end up in a, uh, a house in Liverpool where there are 30 people to a room um, often having um, fallouts with local people and it's not what they expected. Even before they started to live in the accommodation where it was provided by the boss of the cocoa pickers, they had already experienced sharing a floor with many people who they do not know, a mixed sex. There's no privacy or personal. It, it just doesn't doesn't exist. Somewhere to sleep, somewhere to work, and hope that your boss is going to be decent enough to pay you. That's, that's a daily task. While building up a picture of the lives led by the Chinese workers, the police also discovered more about their alleged gang master, Lin Liang Ren. A trained accountant back in China, he'd arrived in Britain in 2000, meeting up with relatives in Liverpool. Posing as a student, he persuaded the immigration service to support his application to stay in the UK. Although it was not known whether he had any links to the people smugglers, it was clear that he was building up a criminal empire using illegal workers, forging cockling permits for his expanding workforce of illegal immigrants and supplying them with false national insurance numbers. It brought him a comfortable lifestyle that contrasted starkly with those who worked for him. The workers were living six or 12 to a room with one toilet, perhaps between 20 or so people, with limited food, limited heating, limited clothing. He, uh, Lin Liang Ren, had got a sports car. He lived with a girlfriend in kind of one room or a number of rooms. And basically, he lived the high life. He went out for nice meals and his particular passion was going to the casino and he spent thousands of pounds down at the casino. Uh, one of the witnesses saw him uh, gamble 650 pounds on one hand the night before the tragedy. In his original interview, Wren claimed to know nothing about the cocklers on Morecambe Sands. You were there, weren't you? Later, he changed his story to say he had been there but had merely been looking after the vehicles as the workers waded out towards the sea. But as time went on, evidence against him began to mount. Investigations showed that he had actually bought the vehicles used by the cocklers, and evidence from company paperwork showed he had been doing big deals with seafood suppliers. He saw a real opportunity to, to make a lot of money, uh, and he was prepared to exploit the people that worked for him in order to make that money for himself. He, he knew that these were people who, who simply couldn't turn to anyone for help. Do you want to count it? Don't worry, I trust you. There was also evidence that Wren had a motive to send his workers out in those appalling conditions. He had agreed to supply two lorry loads of cockles for a dealer on the night of the tragedy. But was all this enough to convict him? The key evidence that we needed was the evidence from the people who'd actually been out there on that day that night, or, or those people who worked for Linda and Ren, and could say that he was the person who was the boss. So without them, it would have been a significant uphill struggle. But finding those people was proving impossible. Despite all the efforts to persuade the surviving cocklers to come forward, they remained hidden, terrified of the snakehead gangs that had smuggled them here illegally. But in the end, it was the greed of those gangs that gave the police their vital breakthrough. Once they'd transported their workers to Britain, the snakeheads wanted paying, and regularly. The cocklers were all given a monthly wage, but as soon as they received it, they had to make payments into bank accounts. We can say that the money that is made by illegal workers is put into bank accounts. Um, Chinese workers go in with account numbers and mobile phones, hand them over to a cashier, and the money goes into the banking system. 
and we were able to trace through that hundreds of thousands of pounds were going to one particular account and then about a million pounds a day was leaving uh, the UK to go to China. Now that's not just from Cockling, that's from all sorts of illegal immigrant activity. Inquiries identified a key figure at the heart of one such financial network, a man already known to police. In a bold move, Mick Gradwell decided to turn to him for help. This was a very delicate inquiry because um, this person looks like he's leading illegal Chinese crime in the country. He's someone who's been targeted by the main crime agencies of the country. And whilst that was outside the remit of my investigation, I had to speak to these other agencies to make sure they were OK with me going to speak to him and to make these inquiries to see if he, could, he would assist us. Once Gradwell received the all clear, a meeting was set up. It was a rather bizarre conversation because it was one of those conversations of I know that you know that I know what you're doing, um, but I want your help. Do you recognise any of the names on that list? I've got 23 people dead in Lancashire and I think you're a person who can help me and who can assist me in locating some named people that I want to speak to. Look, I'm, I'm just a humble northern copper that needs help tracking down his witnesses. And you're the person that might be able to help me do that. And we had quite a, an amiable conversation, and he obviously went away and thought about what I had to say to him. Within hours of the meeting, the first of the missing survivors turned up. Police believe it was no coincidence. It was the right way of doing it. It wasn't the sole thing that did it. It was the inquiries in the community. Um, but by seeing the main man, I think it pulled the right strings to ensure that we got uh, the first witness forward. Over the next 12 months, police re-established contact with all but one of the missing survivors. But they still had to persuade them to tell the truth about their feared gangmaster, Lin Liang Ren. To help win their trust, they appointed interpreter Dawn Teal. Over the coming months, she would build close relationships with the survivors. When we first travelled around the country to meet all the witnesses, I would say almost that all the first round of meetings happened to be fruitless because they were very um, cautious, very frightened. They do not understand the legal procedure in this country. They don't know whether the police are going to help the Home Office or deport them. And also is a fear of the revenge. They were worried that the snakehead or the gangsters my harm them, their children, their family, for revealing what um, everybody else ought not to know. Can you ask him how many people were on the beach at the time? Despite these fears, some of the survivors did begin to talk. The police were finally getting to the truth of what happened at Morecambe Bay and Wren's part in it. When we first found out what um, what happened on the night. It was clear that this was going to be a pressurised night. Half the workforce didn't set off because some of the vehicles broke down. When they got to Morecambe on the night, they got there too late. As soon as they got out there, one of the vehicles got stuck, and every single thing with that night's events went wrong from the very start. Interviews with the survivors supported the statement from Janie Bannister made in the immediate aftermath of the tragedy. Like her, they claimed Wren had ordered them out in the appalling weather conditions and that he was on the shore when the tide cut them off. When one cockler had returned, shocked and freezing, Wren had refused to let him in his car to shelter from the cold. He also ordered the rest of the survivors to cover up his involvement before trying to flee from the sea. <laughs> From the workers who were there that night and the ones who'd worked with him in the months coming up to the incident, it was quite clear they had little regard for the safety of his workers. There was one particular incident where the workers were out and the tide was coming in and somebody became concerned they weren't coming in quick enough and he just said, leave it to God. 
and he just showed that he didn't care, and the only thing that mattered to him was making money. The police now had the evidence they needed to bring a prosecution, but persuading their witnesses to appear in court was another matter. Wren had allegedly warned of harmful consequences for anyone who cooperated with detectives, and some survivors were clearly coming under intense pressure not to testify. They would just say, look, I just received a phone call from my wife or from my father. Is that going to be true? Will he be able to come and harm anybody uh, in my family? Uh, what, what's going to happen? I have no idea. Could you please tell me? Well, I wasn't in a position to give any advice. All I could do was sit in there and listen. Detectives finally charged Wren with 23 counts of manslaughter, and his trial at Preston Crown Court was set for September 2005. But if the survivors were not prepared to go into the witness box, the police...